As you may know, the Sumatran orangutan is my favorite. I already have two videos about this species, but today I thought I'd make a giant video about them as a homage to their amazingness and to celebrate 50 subscribers. I'll be getting very in-depth on each subject, so prepare. I'll be dividing each of my usual segments in two, plus adding a couple of them. Shown on the screen is a strapping illustration. He stands 4 foot 10, weighs in at 86 kilos, and used to be a real hit with the ladies before he decided to model for me. You may recognize him from my social media or from my YouTube profile. He will stare at you for most of the video. Say hi. Anyway. The Sumatran orangutan is one of three disputed species of orangutan. It is found in the Indonesian provinces of Aceh and North Sumatra. Aceh is a province governed by a variant of Sharia law, while North Sumatra has a more western-style local government. Sumatran orangutans can be distinguished from Bornean orangutans by the longer, looser hair and the fact that both sexes have beards. They tend to be lighter in build than Bornean orangutans, though there is a strong overlap in size. Tapanuli orangutans, the third and most endangered species, are similar to Sumatran orangutans but are much smaller, especially in the skull. Sumatran orangutans are arguably the brightest species of non-human ape. They are found to perform better on cognitive tests than Bornean orangutans do. The Sumatran orangutan is the most conserved species of orangutan as well. Relative to the extinct Vietnamese orangutan, thought to be the ancestor of modern orangutans, it is probably the most similar, with the relatively largest head of the orangutans. The Vietnamese orangutan is thought to have died out due to deforestation and human hunting. Hopefully the Sumatran will not meet the same fate. Orangutans have a number of specialized adaptations of the skull. Their eyes are close set which in theory would give them depth perception and ability in more of their visual field, enlarging the size of the visual focus area, although it would also hinder the effectiveness of that depth perception. The frontal sinus is totally absent. They also lack a muscle called a digastricus anterior. In humans, this muscle helps to open the mouth. Instead, orangutans are to open their mouths using only the lateral pterygoid muscle. The unique orientation of these muscles, alongside the powerful platysma muscle, gives the lips of the orangutan an ability to exert a strong grip. Male orangutans, at the end of puberty, develop large fatty pads on their faces called flanges. These serve a dual purpose. They mark a male's maturity and strength, signaling their desirability to females, but they also help amplify the sound of his call. Orangutans have a large air sac attached to their throat. This appendage also amplifies their call. It is by far the largest air sac found in any primate and may contain up to 6,000 cubic centimeters of air at a time. Orangutan arms are up to 45% longer than their legs, the longest of any great ape. Their palms are elongated, and their fingers are strongly curved. This enables them to lock their hands all the way around narrow grips without using the thumb at all. And when that short but powerful thumb is added into the mix, it forms what is called a double-locked grip. Unlike smaller primates, orangutans lack, con lack contrahentes muscles, instead of relying on stronger forearms, strong interosseous muscles, and a palmar aponeurosis to make their hanging expend less energy. The absence of the contrahentes muscles is also seen in the other giant primates, humans and gorillas. The foot of the orangutan is also curved, with very long toes. It has some of the largest feet relative to its torso of any simian primate. In Sumatran orangutans, the flexor digitorum longus muscle in the calf may be split into two separate bellies, the latter of which is called the flexor digitorum fibularis. Unlike in chimpanzees and gorillas, the quadratus plantae muscle is present, though it is shaped unusually. I have heard it told that many orangutans are born missing the nails in their big toes. However, I was unable to find a trustworthy source on the subject, which makes me skeptical of the claim. After all, I have never seen such a toe. Orangutan shoulders and hips are highly mobile. The scapula has a shortened acromion, and the clavicle is elongated, which together increase shoulder mobility. Meanwhile, the iliofemoral ligament in the hip is modified to allow for much greater hip rotation ability. Judging from muscular PCSAs in the forelimb, a male orangutan's grip is roughly four times as strong as the average human. Other muscles in the upper body are also very powerful. Like in other great apes, the supinator muscle in particular dwarfs the human one. The lower body, however, is not particularly strong and is the weakest among the great apes. One fairly well-publicized finding reports that the red hair of orangutans serves a dual purpose. 
It is highly visible in bright light and poorly visible in the dark, protecting the animals from being spotted in their night nests as they sleep, while making them obvious to one another during the day. They also have a very slow metabolism, the slowest of any simian primate. They are excellent at absorbing proteins and fats and use very little of them. In great apes, including both humans and orangutans, fructose is generally not turned to glucose in most somatic cells, but is instead processed mainly in the liver. The difference between metabolisms in Bornean and Sumatran orangutans is reflected genetically. Bornean orangutans have more derived genes related to lipid metabolism, while Sumatran orangutans have more derived ones related to carbohydrate metabolism. The genome of all orangutans is lower in LU elements than the African apes, meaning their evolution has probably slowed down since it began. Whereas humans and the African apes have sweaty armpits that produce a strong smell, the equivalent region of the orangutan is located in the middle of the chest, just above the sternum. In the female, it is usually absent. Relative to the other apes, the brain of the orangutan is broad and globular, weighing about half a kilogram. Like humans, the neurons are slightly lopsided and distributed asymmetrically. Spindle neurons are present, but in lower qualities than in the chimpanzee. Compared to the neurons, the glial cells of orangutans are smaller and more numerous than in humans. The orangutan frontal lobe composes just as much of the brain as in humans, but is shaped slightly differently with a reduced but dense frontal pole and relatively large dorsolateral frontal cortices. Both species of orangutan have brains roughly the same size as those of western gorillas, despite being much smaller animals overall. This is thought to be due to the fact that great apes grow more in late childhood than other primates, and their brain size thus correlates less strongly with body size. Instead, as I have stated in prior videos, the final brain size of primates seems to be correlated more strongly with birth weight. Infant western gorillas and infant orangutans are almost the same size, resulting in the two apes having some early sized brains as adults. Orangutans are born to lone mothers. They are tiny at birth, weighing less than 2 kilos. Baby orangutans have especially powerful limbs for their size and will cling to their mother's hair as she climbs through the canopy. For the first year of its life, the baby is completely dependent on its mother for food, and while solid food is introduced early on, they may be breastfed into the third or even fourth year. Mother orangutans will incentivize observational learning by selectively sharing food to hold their child's attention during complex feeding tasks, which may be a precursor to the more active teaching used by chimpanzees and humans. They leave, an orangutan will usually leave its mother behind a few years after puberty begins. Female orangutans do not generally reproduce until their middle teens, and avoid males until then. Juvenile male orangutans often go a sort of neckbeard phase, in which they will harass females and attempt to solicit mating, often trying to trap her or grapple with her though he usually cuts it out if he tries to fight back. Once the male hits his own mid to late teens, he undergoes a transformation, exploding in size and growing his distinctive flanges, a process that seems to get slower when the more males are in the area. In wild orangutans, this means an end to any sexually aggressive behavior. Evolutionarily, this likely began because after his body mass increased, the male would find it difficult to pursue the female through the trees. That's probably not what's going on in the flanged male's head at the time, however, as soon after his transformation, he usually takes it upon himself to protect females he meets in brief periods called consortships. They have even been observed escorting their partners across open ground. This is dangerous terrain for animals so poorly adapted for walking, especially when predators such as the dole and Sumatran tiger are on the prowl. So the much larger flanged male makes it an excellent bodyguard for the female. The flanged male will announce his presence via a long call, which females seek out and other males try to avoid. In Sumatran orangutans, the long call sounds a little bit like this. Infanticide has never been observed in orangutans of any species. During consortship and copulation, male orangutans will be careful not to hurt the female's child, even if it attempts to interfere. This may seem like a low bar, but since most species of simian primate, humans included, do commit infanticide from time to time, it's got to be worth something.
Sumatra and orangutans use a wide variety of tools. Like all great apes, they build nests or beds to sleep in. They also use leaves as napkins. Sumatra and orangutans in different populations eat a wide variety of fruits that may require tools to eat. For instance, the Nisia fruit is covered in dangerous hair-like spines, so orangutans in the Swakbalimbing swamp area will roll a stick along the fruit to snag the spines before breaking open the fruit to eat its seeds. Sumatran orangutans have a number of gestures used for communication. Some are facial expressions and appear instinctive. Others are manual gestures and seem much more intentional. It may be shocking to learn orangutans will actually wave at one another as an invitation to interact, and captive individuals will present interesting objects to one another for inspection, just like humans do. Sumatran orangutans, judging from cognitive tests by a Swiss anthropology team, seem to be more curious and more cautious than their Bornean counterparts. When presented with complicated puzzles that would provide honey as a reward, Sumatran orangutans are more likely to try to solve the problem through manipulation, as opposed to roughing up the puzzle with brute force. They also explored unfamiliar foods or objects in a more cautious manner, and were found to have better inhibitory control, examining each contraption they had to get through first before attempting to solve it. Orangutans are mainly frugivorous, and eat a wide variety of fruit and seeds. They are thus important seed dispersers that are necessary for the health of old and mixed growth forests. While many seeds could in theory be transported by any primate, orangutans make the best seed carriers. This is because the varied orangutan diet and its large size leads to poop that is an excellent fertilizer, which helps the seeds grow when expelled. Aside from fruit, which is the main source of calories, orangutans also eat seeds, leaves, pith, and other plant-based foods. Seeds are high in lysine and healthy fats, while pith contains vital proteins. While animal consumption does happen, it is very rare and occurs almost solely during drier years when nutritious plants are scarce. If you've seen my videos before, you'll know my spiel about palm oil. Palm oil is a vegetable oil grown mainly in Malaysia and Indonesia, although it is also grown in West Africa and it is found in more than half of pre-packaged food, as well as products like shampoo and even some medications. Its harvest can be divided roughly into two groups, responsible and unsustainable. The latter form is responsible for deforestation on a colossal scale. Palm oil is much more efficient than soybean oil or sunflower oil, its chief competitors. If soybean or sunflower oil were to replace palm oil, then deforestation would get worse, not better. However, palm oil companies, like most companies, especially agribusinesses, will generally shirk their more ethical duties whenever they can. Thus, if you may want to, you may want to sort the palm oil you consume into the responsible and unsustainable categories, then cut out the unsustainable ones and replace them with a better alternative. There is no particular need to favor products with responsible sources over a simple lack of palm oil, or vice versa. After making inquiries of various orangutan-centric organizations, it appears that taking either approach is helpful. You can tell which palm oil is which by using an app such as the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo app, or by doing your own research. Companies based in Asia may have trouble affording sustainably grown palm oil, and as a result tend to be worse offenders than those in the global west, although both have their fair share of especially crummy companies. The RSPO standard co coincides with other agricultural agreements, so if a company is RSPO certified, it is usually certified by other standards as well, but exceptions to this rule include Mars and, of course, the infamous Nestle. If you want to help but don't have the time to sort every product you buy, here are some common substitutions you can make to cut back on unsustainable palm oil. Instead of your normal protein bar, you could try a Gatorade bar. It does have palm oil, but it is of the sustainable variant. PepsiCo brands in general have recently undergone a sharp improvement in palm oil standards, and I think we ought to encourage that. Store brand ice cream is rarely trustworthy. Pint-based ice creams that are more popular, such as Ben & Jerry's and Talenti, usually contain no palm oil, and when they do, have only a sustainable variant. Meanwhile, to my knowledge, haagen never contains any palm oil at all, but it's owned by Nestle, which has other problems you may not want to support. Among toothpastes, Colgate is ranked the most sustainable of all palm oil-containing toothpastes. There are precious few toothpastes that don't use palm oil, but if you can find one, use it. Replace your usual candy bar choice with a palm oil-free candy or responsibly sourced candies like those owned, created by Ferrera. Palm oil-free conditioners and dyes are hard to find, so if you can't find one, then the hair brand L'Oreal has committed to the underground operations to help ensure its palm oil is sustainable. So far, they have delivered. Restaurant chains owned by Yum Ingredients are more sustainably sourced than others. Pizza Hut, Domino's, and although unrelated, are both doing very good jobs as well.
This is Purple Papa John's Pizza, which is not an RSPO member at the time of publishing this video. McDonald's and Wendy's are also RSPO members. The former holds to its Western standard worldwide, while the same cannot be said for Wendy's, which is much iffier. Meanwhile, as of the publishing of this video, Burger King is not an RSPO member, and should probably be avoided until it is. Aside from sorting your palm oil, there are a number of charities that can also help orangutans. The Center for Great Apes helps to support apes of all species, while the Orangutan Project helps orangutans specifically. If you prefer to support local charities and international ones, as well as those who preserve more than just orangutans, the charities known as Hakusumatra and the Nature for Change are led by indigenous people and do great work supporting the Asse and North Sumatra located portions of the Gunung Loser ecosystem. The final way you can support these apes is through ecotourism. Ecotourism in Sumatra is underdeveloped relative to Borneo, and they badly need the help to provide incentives for orangutan conservation as well as conservation of the Ganon Loser ecosystem on the whole. If you go to visit these apes, you can help rectify this issue. Be sure to research thoroughly first, however, because many regions where Sumatran orangutans may be found are racked with fraud and scams designed to trick tourists. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.